Mm. Hi guys, can, can you uh, can you give me a sound check? You're good. Hey guys, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I can hear you guys. Let's see. Um, What the work? Worked. Hey guys, uh, could you give me a sound check? We can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. I was just messing around with my setup here, which my camera obviously does not work. Hmm. Let me try this again. I'm still not working. I'm gonna try one more thing, guys, and then I might just give up on that that setup. Come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Nope. Still nothing. Yeah, I just tried turning my my camera off and on, but didn't seem to affect it. The next step would be turning Zoom on and off, which I, I don't want to do. Because God knows if God's not. Does not if, God knows if it'll come back. So let's uh, let me just get going with that. I guess I'll you guys will I'll spare you guys my 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 picture today. Um, let's see. Let me get going here. Um, Hmm. Oh, I guess actually I can just use my my crummy display. My out of focus display. There is my out of focus display. There we go. Better than nothing. Uh, let's see. Sorry, guys. Just one second here. So, I think this is where we stopped last time, guys. We had this really detailed example. I don't know if you had any... Anybody had any questions about that? Um, if not, um, I think we can just basically finish up. Um, ah, let's see, Juhun has got a question. 
would be something similar to homework. Uh, Jihoon is asking, would the midterm be something similar to homework? Yeah, it'll be like very similar. I'm happy to, mm, we were doing quizzes last semester and I changed it back to midterms this time. So I'm all, um, if one of you guys, Jihoon, if you don't mind sending me a email after the class or whatever, just to remind me, I can put up like last semester's midterms uh, or sorry, uh, sorry, uh, quizzes. And sort of that gives you an indication of what it is. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like, I think if you do the homeworks, in my humble opinion, it should, you, sh you should be relatively straightforward with the midterm. So I would, I would strongly suggest that. Uh, professor? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So do we have like a timer when we start the quiz or is it like, oh, we have all 24 hours to finish it? Uh, we'll have, you'll have all 24 hours to finish it. So what happens is I'll put it up um, at 5.30. And I'll be I'll be around till like six forty five to answer questions, but then you guys will have till five thirty the next evening to email it the responses back to me. Okay. But right. you know, after I mean, I'll hopefully I'll still be able to answer questions, but I I can't guarantee like I'll give you a timely answer. So you know that would that, that's the only thing about that that hour and 15 minutes after you grab you grab the midterm that i'll be there for real time to answer questions okay, okay. um thank you sure um so jihoon is saying homework is kind of confusing and long um yeah it's a schlep it's a lot of work I mean, I, I think, uh, do we email to your CPP? Yes, to my CCPP email. I see. You know. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no way around like the, the grind of the homework. I mean, it's like, it's a grind through it. But that's the nature of this class. I would suggest you guys like do the homework. You know, I think I've mentioned it a few times. That's like do that front and center, get that cranking through there and only go to the book or other sort of studying procedures after you've done the homework or to to help you do the homework say so i think that's but there's no there's just a lot of just a lot of homework to do uh, unfortunately so it will cover the, the midterm will cover both homework one and two yeah All right, guys. Um, but, 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 yeah. Okay. So let's let's get going here. If you got other questions, we can always address them. If I, I'm not always paying attention to the messages, guys. So extra credit involved? No, sorry. And not not at the moment. Until things get you know things get desperate, maybe I'll think about it. But I'm not sure. But um, the midterm is actually next Tuesday. Um, 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 what else was I going to say? Anyway, if um, if you guys have other questions, I miss any important, just chimed in. What? Sorry. Well, Aaron, I might want to read the rest of the. Are you? I don't know if you're, you mean the rest of the chats, chat info. But um, let's see what else. I think that's it. If you guys have questions, I mean, let me just know during the class. Raise your hand or or not. Don't raise your hand. Speak up. I'm not always paying attention. Okay, guys, so we did, anyway, we did, I feel like the, um, sorry. So that, I, I just feel like that example, hopefully that we did last time, um, hopefully that covers a lot of ground in terms of how to think of these models and what we're trying to learn in this class. Again, I think the key element about what we're trying to learn in this class compared to some of your other classes is, we're actually not trying to create a more realistic model of what's going on. Like in a lot of other classes, you're digging deep into like making more and more realistic model. Here, we're going the other way. We're trying to create simplified quote unquote 
engineering models of relatively complex devices so that we can use them to design circuits so it doesn't get too unwieldy. Again, I think last time we went through like a whole procedure for that. And then today I'm just gonna go back to just one of these applications for the diode. Um, the reason I'm talking about this application is it's like a particularly popular application for diodes, which is in power supplies and using it for rectification, this act of rectification. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna run into this in at least in the lab, the 2200L. I don't know if you guys all have to take it or not. Um, you'll probably run it in, run into it in other classes or just would be hear about or maybe, maybe at work, so on and so forth. So you, it, I'd be amiss not to cover, cuff, cover uh, rectification. And um, then after that, I, I think we can just move on to bipolar transistors or whatever, which, you know, we're not going to cover in the midterm. So like this coming Thursday, um, we might just be covering stuff that might not be in the midterm, et cetera. Um, uh, bu, 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 bu. Or, well, let me, let me give it, give you guys this option. If, um, if there's like po by popular demand, we could go through the homework problems this Thursday to get you guys like get your arms around the midterm. And then I can, cause I also owe you guys, I think like what, two or three classes. So I can just record the bipolar stuff. Would you guys like to go I'd rather do go through homework problems on Thursday? Um, Jihoon likes the idea. I, I gotta, I would like to go over homework. Yeah, come on. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, good. That's sold. So Thursday we'll go over homeworks. Um, so just to give me a fighting chance, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, I'll go for like what you guys are um, gonna ask for as we're going, but to give me a fighting chance to make sure I'm not completely unprepared, shoot me like by the class, by like 5.30 of Thursday. If you want a particular homework problem looked at, just shoot me an email so that we can hit all those first, all the sort of the requests. And then once hopefully if you run out of uh, stuff to do, then we can kind of go on to live requests or whatever, and we can try to hit as many as we can. There's only an hour and 15 minutes. So yeah, if you have a particular homework problem you wanna look at, just let me know, email me ahead of time just so that I can prep a little bit. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do on Thursday. And then uh, midterm on Tuesday, and then I'm gonna record the bipolar transistor sort of lectures. And then, you know, you guys can, can catch up to that. And then Thursday, Day, the following Thursday, we'll you know start with wherever that those recordings at. Okay, so rectification. Let's talk about that. Um, so what does rectification mean? I didn't know until six months ago. But you hear about it a lot of time. Rectification. So this doesn't come from some like very smart word i like i like words and history and all that stuff even if it is about circuit design but rectification is sort of from the same root as to rectify a situation to correct the situation fix the situation i don't know why there maybe it's to fix a um a um, a um, power supply maybe that's what they meant but anyway but the what they mean in terms of rectification in electrical circuits, as far as I know, is, you know, you have, you allow a signal to pass if it's of, of a positive polarity and block it if it's negative polarity or vice versa. So you could have something have like sort of, I don't know if you call it positive rectification or whatever, but you can imagine you would only, let's say if you have a sine wave, which is a, particularly good example because this you run into all the time. If you have, if this is time, 
and you have a signal and it's a sine wave or cosine, whatever you want to call it. I don't know which one, which I don't know which one starts at zero. I guess sine starts at zero. And say the red line is the, you put it through some kind of a rec. So the black line would be, you know, signal. And I have a rectifier. Rectifier. And then, you know, red comes out. So the output would be like, would only let the positive sign come out. Okay, so basically all it's doing is it's passing anything positive of going into this, whatever block this is, just letting the positive come out. And, uh, you know, we mentioned this a couple of times, but this is particularly helpful in the very special case where your signal is your like wall, like AC wall power, because um, the way the power grid works in the US, all over the world, is the power is going through the power network into your house in the form of a AC signal. So it's, it stands for alternating current, but it you know, also means alternating voltage. So if you actually look at a signal coming out of your power plug, it looks like a 110 volt RMS value. So 110 volt RMS. So it's about 140 volt peak. And you know, it's got a, um, from peak to peak, it, it repeats every 16.6 .6 milliseconds, I believe. That's a 60 hertz signal. Okay. And so that's what the power is on the plug. But all our electronics like to see a DC power supply. So, like your cell phone, your computer, they don't like to see stuff like power supply. Like, if the power supply is doing this kind of stuff on your cell phone, it's like really bad news. Um, it, it just, does not, it's, first of all, it's really noisy. Your chips inside there aren't gonna like it. Um, they might stop working, they might blow up, all sorts of bad things happen. So what they wanna see is a nice steady voltage. And, you know, more also that's, that's the primary thing and they, they like it to be low voltage. And as you go through your semiconductor and electronics equation, uh, you'll discuss why that is, but you know they want to be like you know I don't know three point three point three volts is popular, two point seven volts is popular. There are all these different voltages that that your or five volts that your electronics like to be at. So so this rectification, which is the first step towards being able to get a DC signal from an AC signal, because the AC signal by definition has no DC component. So if you just try to get a DC component out of this, there's no DC component to be had, it's all AC. Why is that? Well, it has exactly the same amount of, it's the voltage spends exactly the same amount and with the same values as it does in the negative part of the cycle. That means there's no, if you average the cycle, if you average through the cycle, then you'll get zero for the DC value. So it has no DC component. So somehow to get from here to here, you need to rectify, okay? So let's see, why am I, why am I doing this? Sorry guys, let me just make sure I'm in the right path. Okay, all right. What else do I want to say? Okay, so the simple rectification circuit is something like this. What the heck? Oh, so something like this. Let's just talk about the positive rectification. Okay, and the difference between this and what I drew is that, you know, you basically using an actual diode with a constant voltage one. So let's take a look. I think we looked at this once, but let's look at it again. 
So, and you can do the, you can have kind of a negative rectification signal where you have just, you're passing the negative signals just as easily. Okay, so let's look at that. So let's say, you know, this is what my circuit looks like. I have all the R1 and D1. Okay, so the way we analyze this is we, so this is using the constant voltage model. And again, just as a reminder what that looks like, if I did a transfer function of the diode voltage versus current is it looks like we're pretending like instead of an exponential at some VD on, the diode turns on. So here, basically um, here, the model of the diode is looks like a open switch. I'll put the battery in there, but it's basically out of commission. And then, so that's anywhere below VD on, anywhere above VD on, the diode model looks like a closed switch with a battery with VD on value. So this is the simplified model. The actual model is, you know, like an exponential. Okay, so the way we analyze this is we first look at the case where V in is very negative. Then we looked at the, we will look at the case where V in is very positive. And then we'll look at a case where, you know, they cross over. So when VN, basically when these two cases equal each other, okay? There's at some point, the VN at minus infinity, I, I don't know exactly know how to say that in a written form, but when the two equations are, the same is the crossover point. Okay, so first Vn being very negative, if this diode has a very negative side, this side is very negative compared to this side. Okay, the diode is going to be off. It's gonna be like, it's gonna be in this region. So this diode is gonna be off. So I'll redraw the circuit. Always redraw the circuit. My, that's my advice for you guys once you do this. So I would just redraw it with the open diode. R1, V out. So what does this get? What does this look like? Well. So Vn is completely disconnected from V out. Okay, so there's no, like Vn can do whatever it wants. It's not gonna affect V out. So we know that. This battery, one end of the battery is floating. That means this can, like, it's not controlling what is happening on this end because this end is just, there's nothing holding this end at a particular voltage. If anything was holding this end at a particular voltage, then the battery would force this end to be a VD on lower than this point, but nothing is forcing this point. This point is just floating. So all this leaves is R1. So it looks like basically you have your V out connected to R1. And since there's nothing driving 
There's no voltage source, nothing driving this V out means there's no current through R1. So I R1 is equal to zero. So that I R1 times R1 is equal to zero. And by KVL, V out is equal to, this is this end is grounded. So it'd be zero plus um, I1 R1. This is also zero. So long story short, V out is just equal to zero. So whenever V out, Vn is very negative, V out is equal to zero. Okay, that's that case. Then the second thing we do is we look at, any questions about that? No, okay. So when V out, when Vn is very positive, so that's the other end we're looking at. So remember we're trying to fill out what we're trying to do is to, we're trying to do, figure out this curve, V in versus V out. Okay, this is what we're trying to fill out. So we know out, out here somewhere, V out is equal to zero. Okay, we just don't know but we don't know what it does yet here. That's the next step we're gonna do. And we don't know where those two things are gonna, is it gonna be like zero out to here? Is it gonna be zero out to here? Is it gonna be zero out to here? We just don't know where that, whatever is gonna happen is gonna happen. I mean, I'm drawing like what's gonna happen, but anyhow. So, okay, so V out, when V in is very positive. Again, redrawing the circuit. We're gonna have a, so if it's very, very positive, as this point is at plus infinity or like a very high value, then this is gonna be a short. So in this case, notice what's happening by, by like well, how, where, what happens to V, v out, All right? So V out is just gonna be Vn minus VdR, okay? So that's just gonna get driven by, because Vd, I don't know if you guys remember, but Whenever a battery is connected to a point or a voltage source is connected to a point, it always has a battery or voltage source have basically zero output impedance, meaning that they always win over anything else connected there, okay? So whenever you have a battery hooked up to a point or a voltage source hooked up to a point, they will always, you know, it doesn't matter what else is hooked up to that point. Do you guys have any questions about that? About what I mean about uh, why that is or why why that's the case? If we have a voltage source attached to the resistor, would that do anything? Um, like, um, like if we had a voltage source under the resistor. Yeah, so if you had a voltage source under the resistor, it still wouldn't do anything. Okay. Let me let me show you why. Um, so, well, I, I think, you know, ultimately you'd have to do, like, let's say you had a battery and this and the battery is connected to ground and then there's something else wants to drive this resistor. Is that true, what I just told you? I don't know. No, I, I think it's true what I just told you. It doesn't matter what this what this voltage source or something here does, because it's as if this guy, there. If I was going to draw the resistance of this guy, this resistance would be zero, and this guy, no matter what it is, let's say it's one ohm, right? This resistive divider, right between. If this guy is a has a resistance and this resistor is zero, 
this resistive divider, no matter what's hanging off at this point, will always make sure that this point is being driven by this guy and it wins no matter what this guy tries to do. Because this guy, this voltage source, also has zero resistance, but it's going through this resistance to get to this node. So, you know, again, all you have to think about is a voltage divider. As long as this guy is connected with a zero ohm resistance to this node, it's basically, you know, imagine what a voltage divider would look like as if this one is one ohm and it's going, imagine if, if I drew this another way. If you had a one ohm resistor here and a zero ohm resistor here, right? No matter what I tried to do here, this voltage divider would be zero ohm over one ohm plus zero ohm is equal to zero. Right? This guy would just, this is gonna beat anything because of zero ohm, no matter if I try to drive it from what, whichever side. So a voltage source that's connected to a node or a battery that's connected to a node, because it has zero output impedance always wins, no matter what. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jonathan, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So sometimes it gets a little tricky on some of the problems, but like, just whatever, like one, one weird thing that could happen is if somehow you end up with a, with a battery or a voltage source both connected to the same node, then you're in trouble trying to figure out what's, what's going on. But hopefully that'll be rare. <laughs> In real, in real life, if that happens, um, you, you're you basically what happens, like let's say if you go into the lab, don't do this in the lab, but if you hook up, let's say two voltage sources together, each one is trying to beat the other one. The one that has the more output current drive is gonna win. Basically it will pull in as much current as the other voltage source has until that guy just cannot supply any more current and then it will basically enforce its voltage. So sometimes when you see some, you will sometimes see things like that happening when you've got connectivity problems in the lab or something. And um, so it's, a, it's a, like a, it's a, it's a message that you've got a problem with your circuit. Okay. So having said that, so this guy is gonna win, this VD on is gonna win every time. So this voltage out here is gonna be V out is equal to V in minus VD on whenever you're very positive. Okay, so out here, Out, out here, we'll have a graph with a with a sort of a positive slope, but we just don't know where it's gonna be. Okay, so, but you know it's Vn minus Vd on. Okay, and then we gotta see where they e e equate to see where the breakpoint is. So we set the two equal to each other. So V out is equal to zero is equal to V in minus V D on. So V in when V D when V in is equal to Let's see when V in when V in is equal to V D on is is basically the breakpoint. Okay. 
so what does this what does this look like well so let's say this is vd on So anywhere, anywhere below this point, this guy holds. So V out is equal to zero. So you just have zero in your transfer function. Okay, anywhere past this point, you got V out is equal to Vn. Okay, so this says the ratio of V out to Vn. So the slope, look at this equation. Okay, this the equation is of V out versus Vn here. It looks like it has a slope of Vn and an offset of Vd on. Okay, so Basically, you'll get something like this with a slope of one. So if you, let's say your, your VN is at like, oops, let's just pick a number. Let's say your VN is at like, I don't know, let's say VD on for the sake of discussion is 0.8 volts. So we always get the VD on in the problem or midterm or whatever. Let's say Vn is two volts. Your Vd on is gonna be like 1.2 volts, cause that's at that point, it's gonna be V out is at this point, V out is going to be equal to two volts minus 0.8 volts. It's equal to 1.2 volts and so on. So if we plot this graph of this, so now, so this is V in versus V out. Everybody, everybody follow me so far? Any questions? Okay, so, so this is the transfer function of V in versus V out. Okay, now if we go back to, if this is the transfer function for our block, for our circuit, what happens if my VN looks like a sine wave with respect to time? Okay, so I'm gonna have my VN be a sine wave. And then with red, I'm gonna draw V out. So this is the black is V in. Sorry, sorry, I marked this. So this would be time and this would be voltage. So black is V in. And in red, I'm gonna draw V out. Well, basically nothing happens until like, as long as the, notice the breakpoint is at VD on, meaning like VN, this, this VN, right? This guy, VN needs to, oops. Ah. So, so this says VN has to get somewhat positive enough that the Vn value like here will have to be Vd on before V out starts following it. So basically if I zoom in here, v, um, v out is gonna be a little bit behind Vn. So it's gonna be basically at this point is when Vn is equal to Vd on is when the diode is gonna turn on. And then it's gonna basically from then on, it's gonna follow Vn. When it gets to the peak value, so let's let's call this Vn peak. 
So V out here is going to be V in peak. So V out peak is going to be V in peak minus VD on. So here, there's going to be a VD on voltage where the VD, V out is one VD on below it, below V in. And then it's going to follow V in back down. And when V in goes back to being VD on, the diode turns off and then it stays ground the whole time V in. The whole time Vn is below Vd on, V out is just going to equal to zero until the next time Vn gets to Vd on, somewhere out here. Then V on is going to follow it and get to here. Okay. So basically, the circuit has gotten rid of you know one of the lobes of our AC signal. So it got rid of the negative part of the lobe, give or take or a little bit. You know, we lost a little bit because of the on voltage of the diode. We started off, we didn't get the full value. So we were one offset below it, but for the main part, we got it. Okay, so we went from a sine wave to only one half of a sine wave. So now if you take the red and you sort of integrate the voltage values over one cycle, you're going to get this is going to have a DC component. Okay. Everybody, any questions about that? Okay. So, so now we have something like this. Oops. roughly okay but notice i was what i what we wanted was more of a where was it that i drew that more of a dc value i mean we're kind of seems like we're on our way but we have this and not this flat line okay so how do we get this flat line well the way to do it is we can basically you replace the diode sorry the resistor so we had this so we basically want to replace r1 with um, c with a capacitor so the resistor, we want to replace it with a capacitor. So let's see what that looks like. Now, if you just follow the go through the same path, but here let's draw time versus voltage. And say so this is our actually well let me draw it for you guys step by step. So so we got our AC voltage again, yeah. So assume V out starts at zero initially. So assume at time equal to zero, V out is equal to zero. So like assume my V out starts here in red again. So it's gonna wait till Vn gets to VD on, so then it's going to start follow VN. Because 
that basically the diode is going to make sure this this side follows this guy. Okay, so it's kind of get to the end. So it's going to get to the out peak, which is the in peak minus V D on. It's going to get to that point. Now V in is going to start going negative. Okay, so that means that this voltage when was going positive, it's it's basically at VD on minus VN. And then at this, just right after this peak, VN is gonna get just a tiny bit less than its peak value. It means that this point is gonna wanna, you know, basically this diode will, is thinking about pulling this point below V peak minus VD on. But there's a difference here between having a resistor and a capacitor. Okay, so look at what, what happens. If this point, if this point tries to go below VD on minus V peak, okay, before the resistor would allow it to do it, but here, this diode would have to actually discharge this capacitor. The di the resistor wouldn't, there's, there was no charge here left over. There's because the resistor is not a reservoir of charge. So there's no residual charge here at any point. There's either a current flowing or there isn't. Here, this capacitor is a is a um, is a charge reservoir, meaning that if you want to pull, if you've charged this up full of charge or at to some charge level, if you try to reduce that level of charge, you're going to have to basically, this diode would have to pull current out of this capacitor from this direction to that direction. And Remember that a diode cannot do that. So our model, this is sort of our model for a diode as being, you know, a, a water sort of um, water hose or something with a, some kind of a valve and a stopper comes in. A diode, and this would be like this. So a diode can only source current in one direction. It can source this current this way, but it cannot sink current this way. That, that cannot work. As soon as you try to do this, the diode stops you from doing that. The diode only conducts in one direction when this end is higher than that end. So if you try to pull current into the end side from the capacitor, so the capacitor is kind of sitting like this, you're trying to pull current back, the diode, as soon as you ask the diode to do that, it'll turn off. It cannot pull any current in. So which means that as soon as you get to, let me put it in green. As soon as you get to this peak value and you're trying to come down, the diode turns off and that, that voltage will just stay as a constant voltage because there's no way for this charge to go. So let me just remind you of something. So there is basically the charge on a capacitor is the capacitance of the capacitor times the voltage you put on it. So at this point, depending on your voltage VN, depending on VD on, you'll have a certain charge. So the charge will be Q cap, will be whatever the capacitor value times V, uh, VN peak minus VD on. 
So that's the amount of charge you put on the capacitor at this point. And this, capa this diode cannot discharge that capacitor in its low going mode when Vn is going down because it'll just turn off immediately. As soon as it'll try to discharge the capacitor, it turns off. So basically you end up in this situation that as long as the voltage is going positive, okay, the, the, this V out is gonna follow it with a VD on offset. As soon as it gets to this value, so it looks like basically a, 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 at this point on this rising edge, it looks like it closed this die, it looked like a closed switch with a battery charging up a capacitor. But as soon as this starts going down, then basically the diode is just gonna turn off because it cannot sink any current and it's just gonna keep that voltage on the capacitor, okay? And this is what our electronics wants to see. So from this point forward, is we've created the DC voltage that we can plug our cell phone or whatever battery into so we can charge it up. Any questions about that? It is, I, it's like the one cool thing of diodes. Okay. So um, let's see what else do I want to say. Well, I'm going to jump over this and then come back to it. But okay, so we think we're out of the woods. We've got this voltage, fine. But um, reality intervenes, and here's the reality. So, so let's say we we made our circuit. This capacitor. The end. And this is our voltage source. Now let's say we plug in our cell phone here. Now, as long as there's nothing connected here, you'd have a you know straight voltage out here and V out as long as nothing was connected because there was no place for that charge to go. There was no place for the charge to discharge to. It couldn't go this way. So the charge would have to stay there. But as soon as you plug in your cell phone, well, your cell phone is, needs current to operate. So your cell phone itself is gonna start pulling current away from this capacitor and discharge it. Okay, so let's let's see what that looks like. So let's say I am gonna the the cell phone chip and the battery are, are pretty complicated. But let's say for the sake of this class, we're gonna model it with a real simple just a resistor. Let's assume it was just a linear resistor pulling current with it. So we call it R sub L for L stands for load. So that's what's loading on down our circuit. So basically I'm gonna redraw my circuit with my cell phone. So let's see, we call this C, just, we'll just call the name C1. And this guy is R sub L. So, this in our example is our cell phone. Okay, so now let's look at what happens. Well, so it was nice when we didn't have anything connected to this point, it stayed nice and flat. But now let's say I've hooked up my cell phone here. Okay, so what happens now is as soon as this guy turns off, so as, as long as this guy is on, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna add my, my resistor here. 
Well, it doesn't matter because like I said, this battery, as long as you got a battery connected to this node, doesn't matter what else is connected to this node, this battery wins, okay? But as soon as you turn off, you're gonna have a situation where now you've got a resistor connected to your capacitor. And what does this resistor do? Well, this resistor is gonna start pulling charge off the capacitor. It's gonna start discharging the capacitor. So as soon as the diode turns off here, you're gonna start discharging the capacitor until your diode turns on again. Until like, so this, so this repeat will repeat itself, a process as you're discharging. So you get into this situation, well, this is where, uh, so this is what I just drew. So you get to this point, you're gonna charge up to this point, no problem. As soon as the diode opens up, you're gonna discharge that capacitor. Okay. So in reality, this is what things are gonna look like when you have your actual cell phone connected to this. And this, because, you know, then basically the next cycle, the diode will turns it on and pushes back up. This is called a ripple. Okay, so this is um, ripple voltage. So you'd like this voltage to be f absolutely flat, but because of the reality of the situation, it's gonna do a little bit of ripple, but you do not, you want to make this ripple as small as possible given cost and you know size and all these kind of things. So, so, but that, this is like an important parameter for uh, rectification, for having a DC voltage, for having a power supply. I don't know if you guys have run into this, but whenever, um, so would there be a, June is asking, would there be a small time gap where cell phone is not charged until the diode is turned on again? Hmm. Not sure, turn back on. No, I think as long as, see the thing is your cell phone is gonna be charging. If this, if you let this thing, let's say your cell phone. Okay, so the amount of ripple, let me, let me, um, June, let me walk through what some of the characteristics of this ripple and then we'll, we'll get back to your question. Okay, so which I think it will make more sense about when the cell phone, is there a possibility if cell phones will stop charging or stop working, say if it was uncharged when you're plugged in. So anyway, back to this idea. So you're getting some ripple voltage where you wanted the flat voltage. And this ripple is sort of the difference between where you wanted things to be and where they sort of ended up. All right, so, so basically let's say what happens under different values, okay? So now you have what this, what this really looks like. I don't know if you guys remember, I'm not sure I could derive this for, for you guys from off of my memory, but maybe you guys can remember if you have an RC circuit, um, the discharging of this RC circuit follows a exponential characteristic. So it doesn't discharge linearly, it dis discharges with a time constant. So basically what happens is V out, uh, let me see if I can remember this. Um, I think you could say V out, hopefully I won't get this too wrong. V out is um, V in, is it V in one minus E to the minus T, uh, T over RC, something like that as T goes, T goes high, this guy goes to, this 
guy go to one and this guy goes to zero. I think it's something basically like that. You get an exponential drop. So it really looks like an exponential drop as an RC circuit. But if the capacitor is large enough, it looks like a straight line. Okay, so we can kind of approximate as a straight line as long as the capacitor is large enough. But your cell phone will start charging or stop operating if this capacitor you've used for your charge reservoir is too small. That means between these cycles, so remember these cycles from the wall are 16 milliseconds, 16.6 milliseconds apart. So that's a given. You, you, you're not going to get the cycles any faster. So if your capacitor is small enough, you'll actually discharge the capacitor between the cycles. And if this voltage dips low enough, then that's when um, your cell phone is not going to charge anymore, depending on what at what voltage your charger will work or your cell phone chip itself would work. But at some point here, you know, it's not going to work to, the, to zero. I don't know if it'll be, you know, three volts, 1.8 volts, whatever it is, you'll stop working. So what you need to do is have the capacitor be large enough compared to your load so that this dip does not turn off your cell phone or does not turn off the cell phone charging. You want this thing to be so that this ripple voltage is small enough that essentially your cell phone doesn't see it. So you want to have, the, again, by having the capacitor large enough, you want the situation so that um, you don't really feel like feel the ripple. And here's the sort of the equation for, and these are sort of the important <laughs> equations for the ripple on a, they uh, should basically rectifying circuit, okay, with a capacitor. So basically, if you look at the ripple, which are, this is the output voltage, okay, but this is the ripple equation. So take, let's take a look at the different components of this. So remember the max value we get is the peak voltage minus VD on. So the peak input voltage minus VD on. That you really don't really have a whole lot of control over, okay? Because the V peak is coming, it's the, your VN, it's coming from the wall or something like that. That's pretty much said. Your VD on, again, you don't have a whole lot of control over that. You can buy a diode, but they're all sort of V peak is coming from wall, VD on is, you know, give or take, maybe 800 millivolts, maybe it's 700 millivolts, but right around, it's not gonna be like 0.1 volts or 10 volts. And I have a lot of control over that. F in, you don't have a lot of control over because this is the frequency of, of, um, um, what do you call it? Wall power plug, plug AC voltage. So you don't have any control over that. That's just 60 Hertz in the US. Um, you know, if you go to Japan, you'll have it, you know, depending on if you're, which side of the island you're on, you might be at like 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz. So it depends, but it's never, it's not gonna be 120 Hertz. Okay. So, and then RL, you also don't have any control over because that's like your cell phone or your load. So the only thing you do have control over is C load, which is the capacitor um, that you can put in your circuit, can select capacitor, so designer, yes. 
So in some ways, it's actually kind of a pretty simple circuit if you look at it, if you look at this um, from a designer perspective, because you really don't have much control over anything. You can just make this capacitor big enough to you know, limit this ripple, so to minimize the ripple. So what, what is an acceptable ripple? Well, most applications, as you see, you know, this is probably a good number, is they'll allow a five to 10% ripple on the supply. So let's say if you had a three volt supply, they'll allow you know, three plus minus 300 millivolts, or maybe it's three plus minus 150 millivolts. So those are typically acceptable. What makes them acceptable? Well, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, the guys designing those circuits um, get told, hey, like the ripple on your supply, the, you know, your customers are only gonna, they're not gonna be able to give you a clean, flat voltage supply. So you gotta build some level of ripple rejection and sort of the consensus in the industry is, you know, either depending on, you know, if you got typical consumer applications, like they'll accept plus minus 10% ripple on the supply. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna say here? Okay. So, so that's like your simple, this is called a half wave rectifier. Why is it called a half wave rectifier? Well, it's throwing away so it does what you want it to do, but it's kind of throwing away half of your voltage, right? It's like to get to the DC value, what we did was we got rid of, we just kept the positive supply and we just completely got rid of this negative supply voltage. Well, um, so this is called a half wave rectifier. Let me just write it down here. Um, so it does what we what we want, but it has a couple of issues. And so the reason I'm mentioning this again is because you guys will run into, you'll hear about half wave rectifiers and full wave rectifiers sort of continuously in the future. So this is the half wave rectifier. And it does, again, does what we wanna do. It creates this voltage, but it's got this problem with the ripple, okay? So it's, there's, there's a certain amount of ripple um, on, the, on the signal. And there's another problem, which I would say sort of went, did not go over. So we're going back to the problem is it also has a problem that your diode tends to see a very large voltage across it. Why is that? Well, let me see if I got a better graph of that. So let's, let's look here. Okay, like, uh, no, 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 no. Let's see if I, no, this is, this is pretty good. Okay, so let's say you're the diode, right? Around here, on this cycle, the voltage on the diode, the diode is forward biased and the voltage across it is VD on 0.8 volts. Nah, not, not too much, it's good. So as this voltage on the diode on this side on the capacitor stays constant and the input goes lower, okay? So this diode will start having a higher and higher reverse bias voltage across it. So let me draw the diode voltage. So V sub D, I sub D, then it's forward biased. You get this sort of VD on. And remember it gets this is a this is 
I minus I sub S, which is a very small current. So as this voltage starts going low, basically the state, the, sorry, this voltage stays constant. This voltage is going lower and lower. That means I'm moving down this curve in this direction as, as Vn goes down, I'm getting, putting more and more and more reverse bias voltage across my diode, across this diode. So this whole cycle, if you just plot the, the, the voltage across the diode, you'll see that when you, by the time you get to this bottom value, you have two times the peak voltage. So you'll be like way out here at two times whatever this is. So remember I said like, let's say if this was the wall plug. So example, wall plug. So the peak voltage might be, you know, 140 volts. So two times the peak might be, you know, 280 volts. So it'll be like minus 280 volts here across the style, which is starting to add up to a pretty high voltage. And if you remember going back to our diode class at some voltage back here, you will get into breakdown, that your diode will break down. So this means that you basically, your diet will turn into a short. This is just not a good situation. And you, you wanna avoid this point as much as possible. But so what you have to do is to basically get yourself, if you wanna use a half wave rectifier, you wanna get yourself a diode with a very high breakdown voltage, which is physically large. It can be more expensive. So that's one problem is you need a diode with a very large breakdown voltage. And the second thing is you got this ripple and you would like to reduce the ripple. So those are the two problems with the half a rectifier. So you wanna basically do something about that. And basically I'm gonna just really jump in and see if this is, I'm gonna show you guys the circuit. I, I don't think, the analysis, uh, I, I usually go through this analysis, but I don't think it's really worth it given its the result is pretty simple. But if you create, the circuit ends up getting more complicated. If you have this sort of, this, uh, this kind of circuit, it's called a bridge rectifier. You can basically flip the polarity of your diode switches on each cycle so that you can use basically both half of your input sine wave. So if you want to see, um, you know, the derivation of how this works, it's actually kind of neat. And the slide deck goes through it and the book goes through it, but in the end, when you look at the problem sets, et cetera, once you derive it once, it you know it, you don't you don't need to derive it again. Let's just let me put it that way. But the upshot is, it basically it's flipping the polarity of the voltage on this node, so that you basically are getting ripples at half the frequency of what you were getting with the half wave rectifier. So you still get you still get the discharge between the cycles, but now the cycles are as if you're using both the positive and the negative part of the cycle. So the upshot is, I, I think this is like the end, let me see, point is you end up with, well, can't believe we don't have the equation for this thing, but it basically ends up that you, what you're doing in this case is, you know, we said you didn't have control over this, didn't have control over this. We didn't have control over this. We had control over this. 
by using these extra three diodes on and using that particular configuration is as if we've increased our input frequency by a factor of two. So we went through all that activity. So we created this more complex circuit, the so-called bridge rectifier. And from that, it's as if we've cut our ripple in half basically by, by using both peaks of this, the circuit. So again, I used to like cover the circuit, you know, this might get confusing to you guys, but I used to cover it like it would take a whole lecture to cover what this bridge rectifier circuit does, but you would only drive it once and the actual end results, if you guys do the homeworks, et cetera, you'll see that we don't really derive anything. We're just sort of calculating the ripple once you put the circuit together. So it's not like you're gonna configure this in a million different ways or configure this in a million different days, ways. They're always configured the same way and you just have to plug in the values for R, L, C, C1, et cetera. And so I, I don't think it's worthwhile, you know, covering the, the, this derivation in detail. Just be aware, you know, we looked at the half wave rectifier, why it would create this sort of DC voltage, the fact that it had a ripple, that's important. And that by doing a full wave rectifier, we've got a slightly more complicated circuit in the form of these diodes, but basically we're able to cut down the ripple by basically a factor of two. And also it turns out that the reverse bias on the diode goes from two times the V peak. In our example, it was 280 volts to one times V peak or you know, 140 volts or less, depending on what your, what your input is. So anyhow, that's, that's where we're gonna end it in terms of the diodes. Did you guys have any questions? No, okay. If not, just go ahead and um, we'll do, so Thursday we're gonna do problems. Just remember to send me any problems you wanna look at first and we'll do that and then we'll do, We'll take requests after that. All right, guys. Professor? Yeah. I think last Tuesday's lecture hasn't been uploaded. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned that. Sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that. Thanks. All right. Thank you. OK, thanks. Bye, guys. Appreciate it.